Behind me now is Fremont Island, where Jean-Baptiste in 1862 was banished for robbing the dead. In fact, they had ordered that he have, for robbing the dead, tattooed across his forehead. Well, three weeks later, they come to check on their herd of sheep, because the island is used for grazing, and they find no trace of Jean-Baptiste. In fact, all they find is a damaged outbuilding. He had pulled a couple of pieces of wood off of a ranch building, and they find a partially tanned cow. He was trying to make a raft and escape. Well, no trace has ever been found, and it said that his ghost wanders the salt flats and tries to make it back to shore. I'm looking now at the highest peak on Antelope Island, and after spending a little bit of time here, authorities in Salt Lake realized that with the amount of traffic coming and going, it might not be too difficult for Jean-Baptiste to make a friend and get back to the mainland, which is, I mean, right there, the Uinta Mountains. So they decided to send him off to a much, much more remote island, not too far away. Fremont Island, which is not connected by any sort of causeway, and it's got deeper water around it so that you wouldn't be able to escape, is over here. And he was banished there, but three weeks later, they went to go check on him, and they found not a trace other than a couple of uh, little bits of evidence that he tried to make his escape, and nothing else was ever seen of that man again. But the story is ten times this, because Jean-Baptiste was only put here after a shootout with two U.S. Marshals who were claimed to be Mormon vigilantes, after a group of gangsters tried to run the governor out, and possibly were trying to kill him. And this whole story is a lot bigger than what is usually told. It's not just the story of one man who was kind of randomly found robbing the dead. He's wrapped up with something much bigger, and I'd like to go a little bit more into detail about that. To understand the story of one of Utah's most famous hauntings, you need to understand Moroni Clausen's story. He was born in Caldwell, Missouri in 1837, and upon arrival to Utah Territory, he became associated with a band of outlaws. Well, in 1862, this band of outlaws helped drive the governor from his home, from his mansion in Salt Lake City, because the governor was a widely hated man, and he was hitting on a Mormon woman who had recently lost her husband. Well, they drove him out to Tuella, and Porter Rockwell and Wild Bill Hickman cornered him and in a very controversial 1862 shootout killed him and two of his friends. And initially he was buried out in Tuella County in an unmarked grave, but somebody decided to come along and give him a proper burial. But when they dug him up, he was naked. And they looked inside of the cemetery official's office and found that he'd been stealing hundreds of pairs of clothing. It just, it was, they reported that the inside of the office was stacked full of clothes. So they sentenced him to be banished to an island off the coast in the Great Salt Lake because he couldn't swim, and they shackled him in irons and tattooed for robbing the dead on his forehead. And uh, it was there that the story of the haunting of Fremont Island really begins. Of the men to run the governor out in 1862, you had Moroni Clausen, Lot Elijah Huntington, a couple others, and Jason Reed Luce, a private in the Utah Cavalry. And he is buried here in the pauper's plot. Now, the more I look into the people who ran the governor out, the more I find unusual ends. Of course, the shootout in Rush Valley was unusual, but a couple years later, Jason Luce comes up, goes out to a bar in Salt Lake City, shoots his gun into a man's chest, stands over his body, and kind of holds his hands in the air, waiting to be arrested. He was later executed in 1864 and buried in this poor section of the cemetery. In fact, uh, Wild Bill Hickman issued a statement saying that he hoped the truth would come out. Well, it seems that the truth never came out. And of course, Hickman was present at the shooting, although he claims his back was turned and that Porter Rockwell shot him, uh, not Jason Luce, but the other three. He claims they shot him at close range. And Jason Luce was a part of their Wild West gang, but wasn't present at the shootout. Lot Elijah Huntington is another one of those men who died in the 1862 shootout, and he seems to be one of the perfect candidates for a sort of vigilante operation organized by the Salt Lake Police, which was claimed by Wild Bill Hickman. And his story is his father was with the Mormons from the very start. He was one of the men arrested for burning down the Nouveau Expositor, a sort of anti-Mormon newspaper office. And then his father participates in the 1850 battle at Battle Creek, massacring Indians, and he takes part and a conference that terminates the Black Hawk War. Well, of course, his son wants to join the military as well, and he fought in the Indian Wars. He fought in the cavalry of the Utah Territorial Militia. So they kind of give him this order, 
according to some people, to go and run the governor out. Because they don't like this governor, and when he hears that the governor is hit on a woman who just lost her husband, he is incensed enough to join. And he met his end when he was killed by Orrin Porter Rockwell out in Rush Valley in Tuella. This might have been John Baptiste's salvation here on Antelope Island. If you just take a look over to the left, they had a pretty decently sized ranch that would have been contemporary with him, the Fielding Gar Ranch. And with that, you had seasonally occupied houses, you had campfires, you had food, and that's probably why they decided to move him eventually to Fremont Island. And if you get the opportunity to visit Antelope Island, they're famous for their herd of buffalo. I saw this last time I was here, so by 1862, this ranch would have still been under church ownership. And imagine you're Jean Baptiste and you just were ordered by Brigham Young to have that tattooed in your head for robbing the dead. And you walk into the outbuilding and you see a photo almost taunting you of the man who made the order to put you here. And I still wonder, it's only as I walk through now, whatever did happen to Jean Baptiste? I'm sure he just drowned. But it's fun to think. And some of the oldest buildings here on Antelope Island, these would have actually been seen by Jean Baptiste. You have this building, and then I believe this is kind of the house where the people who owned the ranch would live. And then you've got this building here, which would have served as a sort of guest house and a root cellar right down there. So you'd be able to get through cold winters and hot summers by staying here. And then you've got a pretty decent view, although it wouldn't have done Jean Baptiste any good because you could just see where his, you know, where he used to live over the Great Salt Lake. And over here we've got some more recent buildings. And the building was owned by the church at the time, the, the whole ranch was. So I wouldn't imagine that Jean Baptiste would feel any kind of bad way about breaking into here and sleeping overnight. This was used for ranch hands. And he probably would have had more than enough to get by, so long as you kind of made yourself seldom seen. Uh, obviously, he wouldn't be burning these buildings down. He'd probably have a little fire going and he'd clean it up. And then they exiled him again to Fremont Island, which over here around the bend about 10 miles and then a further 7 miles, 8 miles off of the little causeway that you pass when you come in. And if it was too hot outside, it's pretty hot out now in this root cellar. Nice even 60 degrees. Pretty cool. And at night you can imagine John Baptiste seeing the lights of Salt Lake City, which must have felt so far away.